Hey, it's me, Mac Monroe, the founder and CEO of Boss Builders. Attention, business owners, CEOs, and HR professionals. Do you have managers who lack the basic skills to be a great boss? Better contact Mac. Your manager's afraid to address performance issues with employees? Better contact Mac. Managers unable to complete the most rudimentary processes as a boss? Better contact Mac. You're pulling your hair out, wishing your managers would simply step up and do their job? Better contact Mac. Here at Boss Builders, we provide the basic skills every manager needs to be a great boss. We do this in three ways. First, our team of skilled professionals facilitate our signature workshop, Driving Results. This four-day program, offered in whatever time chunks you need, gives participants the basic skills to fix systems and processes, develop employees, and protect your house. We also offer our popular video-based Boss Builder Academy, which allows your managers to have basic skills training delivered to them in short, effective how-to videos, which are supplemented by our monthly roundtable sessions. Finally, we offer our driving results curriculum to organizations that want to license it and deliver it using their own in-house trainers. For more information on how we can help you improve the quality of your managers, better contact Mac. You can do that at bettercontactmac.com or reach us by phone at 931-221-2988. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Boss Builder Podcast, the podcast for those of you who are new to supervision, those of you who are in the role and are struggling, and even those of you who are thinking about making that transition sometime in the future. You know, in all of our Boss Builder Driving Results workshops, we always stress that the boss has three important responsibilities. Number one, of course, they have to be able to fix systems and processes. Secondly, they have a responsibility to develop people. But a third responsibility then we call protect the house. And when we say protect the house, we mean against, uh, let's say, customer complaints. Uh, the second area could be OSHA, safety violations. But third, and maybe most important, is against any legal threats. Our guest today is Joe Price. Joe Price is a member of Robinson and McElwee PLLC. It's a law firm that's headquartered in Charleston, but it has offices around West Virginia and in Ohio. Joe is an expert on how to protect a company from having to go to court for any lawsuits brought about by employee issues. I've heard Joe speak on numerous occasions. He's a great speaker. Uh, when I hear that I'm going to listen to an attorney, I immediately look for a nice pillow, but Joe is a lot different. Joe is going to answer lots of great questions for us. He'll talk about the responsibility that you as the boss have in keeping your company out of court. He'll give us an insider's view of how a, how a lawyer builds a case, something very important for you to know. He'll even actually give you some information on why performance management and evaluations may not even be the best defense against a lawsuit. So with no further delay, let's meet our special guest, Joe Price. Joe Price, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mac. It's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. Now, this is great. I heard you speak at a conference in Charleston and several months ago. And I must admit, when I saw that two of the speakers before me were lawyers, I decided I might just get comfortable and take a little nap. But your presentation was by far the best legal presentation I've ever heard. And I won't go through and, and tell everybody what it was, but basically I came away with it uh, from it, knowing that if you are not careful, you are going to get in some serious trouble from a legal standpoint. And so I knew at that point I'd have to have you on the show. And so here we are today. Um, I've got a list of questions for you. And so I thought I'd just go ahead and dive right in. You know, of course, our audience is newly promoted supervisors, those who are in the role and struggling a little bit, or even those who are thinking about taking that role. I'm thinking our podcast today would be especially appropriate for someone who's kicking the tires on the job because we may well scare them away from it, which in some cases, that's a good thing. So, uh, so Joe, let me go ahead and start and ask you, 
what three things are most likely to cause labor and employment legal issues for businesses? Well, Mac, thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I think in, in my experience, there are really three areas uh, that, that tend to be the most problematic. The first uh, is what lawyers call adverse employment actions, uh, and those include such things as terminations of employees. That's obviously the, the one that's most fraught with danger. Uh, but even reassignments, uh, promotions uh, to one degree or another. Uh, and then uh, the most recent ones that we've seen sort of uh, on the horizon have been these cases in which employees assert that they have been retaliated against in some way as a result of some sort of a report to a government agency or even an internal complaint with regard to such things as violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, that, that type of thing. Um, the second area that recently has become uh, very problematic for reasons we'll talk about probably a little bit later on in this podcast is the area of performance evaluations. Those things have turned into a literal minefield uh, in the course of litigation and employment lawyers now find uh, whether you're on either the employee's side or the business's side uh, that these performance evaluations are, are really fertile ground uh, for the plaintiff's lawyer to develop evidence of some claim against the business and in many cases against the boss or the supervisor that took action against them. Uh, we always uh, see the employee uh, in those things as a negative in the sense that what we're doing with performance evaluations, at least the, the traditional type of evaluation, uh, is sort of pointing out the strengths of the employee, but then uh, we, we are always pointing toward things that either, quote, need improvement, close quote, uh, or, or are just plain negative. And these things are always perceived by the employee um, as, as negative rather than helpful. Uh, and, and psychologists have been telling us for quite a while uh, that all criticism is negative, whether we call it constructive or not. Uh, the other part of that that we see is that the, the performance evaluations the traditional type, at least, uh, don't really serve to address deficiencies uh, and promote uh, either innovation or, or development of managers. So it's that sort of legal minefield of the, the performance evaluation and documentation uh, that has really become even more problematic in the last few years. The third thing, particularly uh, in my geographic area here in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio uh, is union activity uh, and the things that employees uh, can do that are protected under the National Labor Relations Act and other laws. Uh, and if we're not careful as managers and businesses, uh, we find ourselves embroiled in unfair labor practice proceedings with the National Labor Relations Board. Well, of those three main areas, why would you say those are the most common trouble points? Well, they, they all involve sort of a common thread. Uh, and that common fled thread uh, is that each of these things or the processes uh, that, that are around each of those things all involve some sort of direct conflict or confrontation uh, between employees and supervisors. Uh, so these things always become... Uh, a sort of a negative influence in the workplace and can become uh, literally, literally physically uh, uh, confrontational from time to time. Now, how does the boss's actions trigger litigation? So litigation, I guess, is the act of we're, we're going to end up in court, right? Yes, we are. Uh, and it's really... Uh, the boss's actions, really he or she is the point of the spear uh, in all of these things. Although the, the prevailing statutes uh, are laws that directly impact the operations of the business, the company, 
it's the individuals involved in that business, uh, those who are making the decisions and those who are announcing those decisions to the employees uh, who are the, the focal point uh, in a lot of cases of the legation. What, what begins to happen as you see these conflicts uh, continue to develop and expand uh, is that there's a lack of dialogue uh, between the boss or the manager uh, and the employees, and that begins to result in this us versus them environment. Uh, the performance evaluations that I mentioned a little earlier, uh, we also know that those things and the process of the performance evaluations create significant stress uh, on the part of employees uh, to the point where some get physically sick uh, when they go through this traditional performance evaluation process. Uh, and that results in not only greater division between the manager and the employee, but a tremendous amount of dis distrust and eventually, uh, in a lot of cases, pushback by the employee when they're criticized. Uh, we also then have um, a lot of activity right now uh, that surrounds these differences uh, that are sexual, that are generational, that are cultural, um, and that breeds a lot of activity in the area of sexual harassment. You know, the most recent uh, manifestation of that is the, the Me Too movement, uh, and there are tremendous difficulties in the business environment uh, where you have men and women together. We have a number of uh, clients now who are, are refusing to permit uh, employees to travel with a single person. Uh, so if a boss is traveling with a female subordinate, uh, they're often required now to have a third person along so that there is almost a witness to what occurs. Uh, and we then have uh, the issue of what are now commonly called the millennials uh, and how we begin to relate to them, because all of the studies are indicating that, that they need things much different than do the, the customary, uh, more mature employees. So the, the boss is really the point of the spear in all of these interactions, and just about anything that the boss can do or, or that he or she fails to do uh, can trigger uh, these adverse responses by employees, and that in turn can trigger litigation. Well, right now, I'm sure you have everybody's attention. Uh, I would be terrified if I had to go to court. But aside from that threat, what other effects do those actions have in the work environment and even in operations? Well, the, I think really, when you look at the threat of litigation, that's a big one. But from an operational standpoint, the effect may be even more dramatic uh, because, as we all know, uh, those environments where there is a significant amount of conflict, uh, whether it be obvious conflict or sort of this underground conflict uh, in which employees don't cooperate and don't really buy into the manager's style or programs, uh, can actually have, I think, a greater uh, negative impact on a business than the litigation can. Well, let's say that we have a disgruntled employee. One of those things that you mentioned, those top three, affects somebody and they're unhappy. So what would a lawyer look for when they bring a lawsuit on for somebody who's in that case, that, that disgruntled employee? Well, this is uh, an ongoing process for lawyers. We love it. We, we get into the, the theories legally, but what we then begin to do um, is to use every device that the law permits us to use uh, to determine what we think would be the best arguments in behalf of our client to the jury. And it really doesn't matter whether we're on the employee's side uh, or on the business's side, we look for the same things. It may be a mirror image of the same things, but we look for the same things. Uh, what, we, what we go through is a process, as you, I'm sure you're aware, there's a complaint that's filed with either a state or a federal court. And then there's this process called discovery. 
Uh, and what that means is uh, for 120 bucks or whatever it costs the employee to file a lawsuit, uh, they can file the proceeding and get it started. But then the lawyers begin to look at everything that they can get their hands on, which will assist them in presenting the evidence at trial. Uh, this discovery process involves everything from depositions of uh, various folks, certainly depositions of the operative managers and the employee, uh, but it also involves a, a look at virtually every record uh, that the business may have, which would indicate how this employee was treated versus other employees, um, and it will, it will inevitably lead uh, to the lawyers looking at what are called comparables. Uh, that is, if you have employee A who was discharged uh, for whatever reason, the lawyers then begin to look not just at employee A, but at all of the other employees who have ever been discharged for some period of time, uh, trying to make comparisons. Uh, was this particular employee that was fired treated the same way that the other employees were? Were there differences? Uh, is there any evidence that there was gender base uh, in the discharge to fire a female? Um, it, it also then is a process by which the lawyers will look at such things as the performance evaluations uh, to see whether or not there were any real efforts made uh, to identify and address clear deficiencies that the employee showed during their employment. Uh, there will be, if there was a complaint made, for instance, by the employee who has now been discharged, that what we will look at is anything that would indicate that there was or was not uh, an investigation made by the business uh, of that complaint to determine whether or not the complaint was valid uh, and whether or not any action was taken, particularly in cases of something like sexual harassment. Um, if a female employee complains, did we do an adequate investigation? What did we find? Uh, and what did we do about it if we determined that in fact there was cause to believe that the, the harassment had occurred? So we look at all of those things as lawyers. Um, we also look at the question of whether or not, even more broadly than just the individual employee who has been discharged, whether or not employees in protected categories, and by that I mean if the discharged employee, for instance, was a female or a minority, how have females and minorities generally uh, been treated within that business and how have females and minorities generally been treated by the individual boss or supervisor uh, who made the decision or participated in the decision to terminate the employee? Uh, and then finally, uh, what we are looking at pretty intensely uh, is whether or not the, the termination, if it's a termination, uh, or a failure to promote uh, or any adverse employment action was the result of some sort of a retaliatory motive. And by that I mean, let's assume that we have uh, an employee who uh, four days before they were terminated had gone to their boss and said, you know, I think we may not be in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act, or went to their boss as a female employee and said, I'm being sexually harassed. You know, the termination of that employee four days later runs up a tremendous red flag for lawyers uh, because just that short period of time between the complaint and the termination uh, clearly indicates that there may have been some sort of a retaliatory motive here. Uh, so we then look at this long list of things that can result in retaliation you know, I think one of the questions I get most frequently is, well, I thought there was such a thing as at-will employment. Well, there is, uh, and my state, my home state here of West Virginia is one which recognizes uh, the doctrine of at-will employment, but 
the last time I counted, there were at least 22 exceptions to that in West Virginia. So it's a series of, of analysis by the lawyers of everything they can lay their hands on that will allow them to make an argument to a jury uh, that their client uh, is telling the truth, whereas the other side is not. And now let's take a break for a quick word from our sponsor. What do you do when you have an employee who is highly skilled and highly motivated, but is still not successful? Some of these symptoms might be a person who's abrasive to others. Maybe they're not able to effectively communicate to others. Sometimes they say inappropriate things in meetings or in a one-on-one -on -one session. You observe them being culturally insensitive or highly opinionated. Or maybe they just have a few rough edges that need to be removed in order to be successful. In these cases, training is not your best option. At Boss Builders, we recommend coaching. Our strategic partner, Wisdom Tree Coaching, provides one-on-one -on -one or group coaching to resolve focus factor problems. The ICF certified coaches at Wisdom Tree Coaching use behavioral assessments and 360 surveys to define the root issue of the problem and then co-create solutions with the client. Wisdom Tree Coaching also facilitates a popular practical course entitled Coaching as a Discipline for Managers. Your managers will get helpful and useful skills to provide a coaching approach with their direct reports to mitigate and eliminate focus issues. Remember, training fixes skill problems. The best way to fix a behavior problem is through coaching. Contact the professionals at Wisdom Tree Coaching at 304-549-4630 or you can find them online at wisdomtreecoaching.com. And now back to the show. Well, how long typically does it take to gather all that information? That's one of the biggest problems the business will face. It depends, Mac, almost entirely on the jurisdiction um, in which you, you are litigating the case. Uh, in West Virginia, it depends on the county. And it does in Tennessee, and it probably does in Ohio and other states. But at minimum, uh, the process of gathering all of that information is going to take at least six months. Uh, we have one case pending right now in which we happen to be representing an individual employee. Um, that case has been pending now for five years. <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what our client says. Wow. So you I imagine so. Well, all right. So you have, let's say you've spent six months, you've gathered all of the evidence now. Um, how do you build a case? Do you have a methodology that you use? In most cases, you do. You start out with a theory, uh, but then you develop all of this information. You begin to put all of that together. And as you then get to the point where you're going to be trying this case to a jury, what you do as a lawyer is put together the facts in a way that you hope will impress the jury that your client uh, is, is, has done the right thing if it's a business or is the boss. Uh, and if you're representing the employee, uh, you're going to convince the jury that the boss and the business uh, really did the wrong thing for the wrong reason uh, and your client should prevail. Um, I often tell the story, and, and I know you've heard this one, but I had a, a great aunt uh, who lived for many, many years in Pennsylvania and is uh, on the internet. You can look her up, and her name is Elizabeth Price. And as kids, uh, we used to love to go to visit our great aunt Elizabeth's house because she had this uh, beautiful old home on a canal and the back of the house was a great big sunroom with lots of windows and tremendous light. And she had a, uh, actually a mechanical bird in a cage. And we used to love to wind that bird up and listen to the bird sing. And then on very special days, uh, we would get to watch her paint a little bit. Um, and what we would see her do is go over to the canvas and take her brushes and her palette, and she'd mix the colors together. And she'd walk over and she'd put a little dot of paint on that canvas. And we'd stand there and watch her, and she'd put another little dot of paint on the canvas. And, you know, within 15 or 20 minutes, she'd have probably 100 dots of paint on that canvas. And 
what you would then see if you stepped back a few feet was a flower. Uh, she was an impressionist uh, in Pennsylvania. Lawyers do the same thing, uh, but what we work with uh, is the minds of the jurors. Uh, and what we do is we take uh, little snippets of testimony from depositions, uh, particular questions that we want to ask the witnesses on the stand, uh, documents that we have gained in the course of this discovery process. And we to try to weave all of that together so that we create in the mind of each of the jurors a picture of what happened, uh, if, if we're the plaintiff's lawyer, a picture of what happened to that discharge employee and why the boss in the business uh, should be found to have somehow damaged her. If we represent the business, we're trying to paint that same impression uh, of why the business did exactly the right thing in this particular case. Um, and so as we build that case for the jury, that's what we're looking for, is where do we find each of those little snippets and how do we then put those together into a painting that the juror will see and believe us? That's a powerful analogy. When I saw your talk, you had the visual and that actually, that was one of the most significant things I think I've ever heard. I'd never really seen it from that perspective. So with that said, how does the boss defend against having to put themselves through this? Are performance evaluations a good firewall against the lawsuit? You know, 10 years ago, I would have said, yes, uh, I've changed my opinion on that over the years. I think at this point, uh, they probably create more problems uh, than they solve. Uh, it used to be uh, that the performance evaluations were done uh, in a way which everyone thought promoted consistency. And that's what we were looking for, because when the lawyers came in, the lawyers would be looking for anything that was inconsistent. So what we as businesses did was to develop these formal performance evaluation programs um, in which we used a series of forms which were designed to ensure consistency so that the lawyers couldn't look at all of that and find these little snippets of inconsistency that they would be presenting to the jury. But what we have found is that those formal performance evaluations uh, are such that they really drive inconsistency more than they do consistency. And that happens because supervisors are inconsistent. Uh, the entire process is driven by the forms, uh, which means that the bosses and the supervisors feel compelled to follow exactly what's on the form. In a number of the situations, you can read the forms in ways that are terribly ambiguous. And in one section of the form, the supervisor may rate a person in one way. And, you know, two sections later, there seems to be something which is extremely similar. And yet the rating given by the supervisor is entirely different because the supervisor perceives that portion of the form differently than they did the first portion of the form. You then run into the problem of having different supervisors. So if you have performance evaluations going back 10 years, supervisor A was perhaps a, quote, easy grader, uh, and the performance evaluations that supervisor prepared uh, were, you know, reasonably good to very good for the employee. A new supervisor comes in and two years before the termination of this employee uh, finds that the employee is deficient and that raises the question, why? All of a sudden we have a good employee who seemingly has been rated very poorly. You know, juries look at that with some degree of skepticism. So we have all of these different things that that go together now, and we have found that the, the greatest wealth of information, if we are representing a discharged employee, 
that is helpful to us comes from those performance evaluations. And yet the supervisors and the businesses are convinced as they produce those things that what they're doing is protecting themselves. Uh, I think in this day and age, uh, we're looking at a situation where the performance, the traditional performance evaluations uh, are probably something which need to be significantly changed in order to protect the business. No, it seems a, it's a little scary because those we've always been taught are, you know, that's your documentation. And when that is something that's called into question, uh, that seems like it's a lot to worry about. So with that said, um, doesn't business now, I mean, the way things are, wouldn't that just require a lawyer to run the business so we don't get sued? I always tell uh, any of the clients that we have that come in that, that are businesses uh, with which we consult, never let your roy- lawyer run your business. Uh, it is the, the business folks the bosses, uh, the entrepreneurs who need to be making the decisions as to what's right for that business from a business perspective. What the lawyer can do and should do is to be able to sit down with the entrepreneur, uh, sit down with the boss and say, here are the things that we see that present risk to your business. Having identified those risks, we can then go through the process of assessing how big each of those risks may be, developing programs or plans that would minimize those risks, and then allowing the business to go ahead and choose what it prefers to do once it understands where those risks lie and what those risks are. Okay. Well, getting back to the boss who's just sat through and listened to, you know, 25 minutes of all of these things to look out for, if you could give him just one piece of advice, Joe, to avoid a lawsuit, what would that piece of advice be? The one piece of advice, Mac, would be that they listen. Uh, And that may sound a little strange coming from a lawyer. Uh, But I'll tell you another story. Uh, Before I went to law school, I was in a uh, sales and marketing position. Uh, And it was an industrial sales and marketing position. And before they would put us out in the field, uh, they had us take uh, a training course, which had been developed by one of the large business machine manufacturers and sellers. And it was a three-day course, uh, a lot of role playing, but the first entire day, Uh, was devoted to a program called Effective Listening. Uh, And what I learned from that was the most important information that you gain is when you listen to what someone else is saying. And for a new boss, if you listen carefully to what your employees are telling you, you get a wealth of information about things that concern them, uh, about how they view your communication style, what their communication style is. Uh, You get information if there is, for instance, any sort of union organizational activity. You will definitely hear about that if you listen to what folks in your workplace are saying. So I think from a perspective of both the business and and a lawyer, uh, if you listen to what's going on around you, and really have open communication and dialogue uh, with both your subordinates uh, and your superiors, that really is the key to avoiding a lot of the problems uh, that lawyers will eventually have to deal with. So Joe, thank you for uh, all the great information you shared. I'm pretty sure my audience now has more questions and maybe more things to worry about. What is the best way for my audience to reach you? Uh, the best way, Mac, is my email, which is J as in Joseph, M as in Moore, P as in Price, at Ramlaw, R-A-M-L-A-W dot com. Great. Well, Joe, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be on the show. And, uh, you know, we are grateful for all of the great perspectives and information that you shared with us. Mac, it's always a pleasure.
Well, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Boss Builder Podcast. If you are listening to our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, would you do us a favor and leave us a quick review? Positive ones, of course, are appreciated, but it really helps us get the message out. Until the next time we meet, please get out there and do your very best. We call that at Boss Builders, bossing up and bossing on. So until the next time we meet, get out there, boss up and boss on. Goodbye.